Hey everyone, in recent years there have been many Galaxy A-series phones, and they're among Samsung's most popular devices, which is no surprise really since they carry Samsung's name and they strike a good balance between price and features. This year the Galaxy A52 might even outshine its siblings because it struck that balance perfectly. So if you're looking for a mid-ranger, is this the one to get? I'm Angie for GSM Marina, and this is our review of the Galaxy A52. The Galaxy A52 has a new design. It's got a plastic back and frame, but it's high quality so it doesn't feel cheap. The non-reflective finish on the back is soft and silky to the touch, and the color is solid candy violet. Samsung is calling it awesome violet. The Galaxy A52 has Gorilla Glass 5 on the front and IP67 dust and water resistant, which is really nice to see, especially on a mid-ranger. On the front there are some pretty thick bezels which give away the phone's price segment and a small hole punch centered close to the top of the frame. Lower down, there is an under-display fingerprint reader which is consistent and reliable, though a bit sluggish for today's standards. The screen itself is a 6.5-inch AMOLED panel with a Full HD resolution and a 90Hz refresh rate. This year marks the first time high refresh rate screens are included in the A-series, and all of the new phones in the lineup include it. 90Hz is an entry-level high refresh rate, especially with 120Hz becoming more common, but you'll still get a smoother experience while scrolling. Samsung doesn't seem to include an adaptive refresh rate option, so the phone will stick to 90Hz most of the time. Most apps run at this higher refresh rate, but we were most curious about games. With the help of performance optimization and Samsung's game launcher, we got some titles like Alto's Odyssey to take advantage of the panel. So for lighter titles, you'll definitely be able to enjoy the 90Hz. The screen is brighter than ones in the past, and we got a very good 794 nits of max brightness on our tests. Colors are also excellent on this phone, and you get to choose from the default vivid mode or natural mode. The latter can be considered perfectly color accurate too. Samsung has also included something called Eye Comfort Shield, which adapts the colors during the day and reduces blue light in the evenings. Unfortunately, the panel lacks HDR certification, though it does have Widevine L1 support, so Netflix can properly make use of the Full HD panel. Watching videos on this phone is even nicer thanks to the stereo speaker setup. It uses a bottom firing regular speaker and the earpiece as a second channel. It's not the loudest speaker out there by any means, but it scored a good loudness score on our tests. The phone also has a Dolby Atmos implementation which optimizes certain sounds depending on the media you're enjoying, like the sound of footsteps in a game. The phone also includes a 3.5mm headphone jack if you're not a fan of Bluetooth. With the 4500mAh battery, the phone scored a respectable 105 hour endurance rating on our tests with the 90Hz refresh rate switched on. With it in the 60Hz mode, endurance increased 108 hours which isn't that much of a difference, so you're better off sticking to the higher refresh rate. The one exception would be videos, which don't take advantage of high refresh rates anyway. The phone ships with a 15 watt charger in the box that can get it from flat to 34% in half an hour. That's not too bad, but the A52 also supports 25 watt PD charging, which gets it from 0 to 52% in half an hour instead. The only downside here is that you'll have to buy the higher watt charger separately. The phone sports a Snapdragon 720G chipset and either 4, 6, or 8 gigs of RAM. More importantly, it flies through day-to-day -day tasks smoothly and offers more than enough performance for all but the most demanding of users. The Galaxy A52 is launching with Android 11 and One UI 3.1 on top. Samsung is promising three major OS updates and four years of security patches, which speaks volumes about the potential longevity of the phone. One UI 3.1 isn't vastly different from One UI 3.0 or even 2.5. There are some design changes like the default lock screen shortcuts, which are now monochrome, as well as some functional ones, like a well-being widget on the lock screen which keeps track of how much time you spend on your phone. The notification shade now covers the entire screen, even if there's no notification card to be found, and the quick toggles can be edited directly from here instead of going into the menu. More useful is the notification history, which is great for those times you've accidentally dismissed a notification too quickly and can't find what it was about. One UI also adopts Android 11's bubbles and lets you turn incoming message notifications into conversations that you can then minimize to a bubble. 
Samsung's Music Share is also present here, which is great to see. It allows you to play music through the Bluetooth accessories connected to our friend's Samsung phone. Permission handling has also changed in One UI 3, and now you get a new prompt for permissions every time an app requests it. The settings menu has also had a design change. Recent searches are shown as bubbles instead of a list, and you can now search for settings by using hashtags, which saves you from hunting endlessly through the menu. Even the dialer has some cosmetic changes, and you get to pick from two layouts for the in-call screen. Other than that, you'll find Samsung's classic edge panels, Bixby, and the game launcher. The only thing not included is DeX, but even with it absent, you can still use the link to Windows feature for better PC integration. As a whole, the camera UI is the same as in other Galaxy phones, but Samsung has also included a new fun mode. It's a collaboration with Snapchat that puts some AR filters for both photos and videos in the native camera app. Naturally, it requires an active network connection to work, and unfortunately, you won't be able to save your favorite filters since Snapchat periodically changes them. Now, as far as the cameras themselves are concerned, the Galaxy A52 has a 64 megapixel quad bayer main snapper with OIS, a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera, a 5 megapixel macro cam, and a 5 megapixel depth sensor. This is pretty standard for most modern mid rangers. During the day, photos are decent enough, though unremarkable. Detail is plenty, the dynamic range here is wide enough, and colors are lively without being oversaturated. There's higher levels of noise and noise suppression artifacts, though which is unusual for Samsung. The phone also has a scene optimizer, which can be sluggish and doesn't make a huge difference for the most part. All the same, it saved the occasional still, so you should leave it on. Photos are output at 16 megapixels by default, but you can also capture them at the full 64 megapixel resolution. Usually, this doesn't make much of a difference when dealing with quad bearer cameras. But with the A52, we were impressed by the amount of extra detail it brought into the shots. All the same, you should know that it's a bit slow when capturing these stills. If you want to zoom in, you should know that the Galaxy A52 lacks a proper telephoto and you'll be getting upscaled crop shots instead. There's a lot of extra softness visible, those shots are usable. At 4x and 10x zoom, however, they have even more softness and sharpening artifacts, so we would just avoid them. The ultrawide camera captured 12 megapixel snaps, and we saw a lot of extra softness around the edges of the frame. Colors are less saturated and lively than the main cameras, and the overall palette is colder. Still, it delivers solid performance for the class. When the light gets low, the Galaxy A52's main camera performs very well for a mid-ranger. Nighttime photos have very good definition and low noise. Colors are well retained too, and the dynamic range is amazing, especially if you look at how highlights are rendered. Night mode, however, was a disappointment. First, the photos come out with a crop to 12 megapixels, meaning they're not as wide. And in most photos, highlights got clipped and shadows got darker compared to the regular auto mode. It's the first time we see a night mode that makes the nighttime photos worse, especially from Samsung. Nighttime zooming into two times is quite possible too, and the quality is usable here. Again, night mode makes things worse, so you don't want to use that here. We were quite pleased with the photos the ultrawide captured at night too, especially for the class. The color rendition is nice, and even though there is visible noise upon close examination, this camera punches above its weight here. Night mode in the ultrawide was an even bigger flop than on the main camera. Not only were highlights clipped, but you could easily see glaring color artifacts which rendered the photos unusable. We really think Samsung dropped the ball with this one. Portrait mode is good, but not impressive. The background blur is natural and convincing, and it doesn't go overboard. Subject separation did trip up on occasion, especially with more complex backgrounds or crazier hair. Honestly, we expected a bit more from this phone, especially considering the 5 megapixel depth sensor. Macro shots, on the other hand, are impressive. While there's no autofocus, it has a wide focus plane, and shots came out nice and detailed. The 32 megapixel camera on the front snapped 8 megapixel stills. Selfie quality is solid, with plenty of detail and decent noise performance. Skin tones can be inconsistent, though. There's also both Auto HDR and the Scene Optimizer for better dynamic range. Selfie portraits are surprisingly pleasant, and both the bokeh and subject separation were quite nice. The Galaxy A52 can record videos at up to 4K at 30fps on the main camera, the ultrawide, and the selfie camera. From the main cam, detail was excellent, and the processing was fairly natural noise was non-existent, and the dynamic range was wide. The colors were great too, and the videos had really natural color reproduction. 
Actually, as a whole, videos from the different cameras have better color consistency than the photos. With the ultrawide camera, there's more noise and the shadows had somewhat distracting noise patterns, but as a whole, not bad. If you want to zoom in, you'll find that footage looks rather decent, especially at two times. There's enough detail, noise is kept at bay, and colors are solid. Don't zoom in too much beyond that though, because it starts to look more like a painting than a digital video. If you drop the resolution to 1080p, footage from the main camera suddenly has a lot of extra noise, so we just stick to 4K. Video stabilization is available for both cameras, but only at Full HD. The general stabilization does a decent job of smoothing out jitters and handles pans well. There is also the option of Super Steady Mode, which gets the video feed from the ultrawide camera. The Galaxy A52 is the only phone in this price range which has both a high refresh rate and an IP67 rating. So if those are your priorities, then you have your answer about whether you should get this phone. If, however, you want a more powerful chipset or a better camera setup, then you have some other options to consider, namely the Poco F3 or the Redmi Note 10 Pro respectively. The Redmi K40 Pro might be its biggest competition thanks to a more powerful chipset, a display with an even higher refresh rate, but a lesser IP53 rating. Most importantly, you should know that Samsung has done an excellent job with this phone. So if you're considering mid-rangers, this one should definitely be on your list. Thank you for watching everyone, stay safe, and I'll see you guys next time.